See, the thing about kitty litter that I think is weird, right? Yeah. It's like, it's just rocks. Like, what, what makes a cat more inclined to poop on rocks? That's just, just what they get used to when you get a kitten. So, so you just you train poo, the cat you just put them in, the thing. in a Pavlovian kind of way to be like, you poop on the rocks. That's just, that's just what we do here. Not even Pavlovian. You don't give them anything. You just put them there and then they associate the You food. don't give them treats? No. So how does one train a cat? One does not need treats to train a cat. No. You just put them in a spot and hope they do it? Yeah. That's <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Namecast. My name is Nathan, and with me is Kevin. the man who wears the pajama pants. Oh, yeah. It's Sunday. It is Sunday. You're... Listen, way to give it all away, but jeez, oh. jeez, we got a good show lined up for you guys. We're going to be talking about. Uh, you, we said this beforehand. It's going to be a bit of a not an adversarial kind of show, but there's going to be some some debates going on, yeah. some discussions about gameplay versus story, hard versus punishing, and how important is Zelda actually? And we're going to do something pretty cool because I saw I was reading through the comments, doing some boop boop, boop research, and I saw um, it was it Ryan. It's like, hey, I uh, I think I want to work in games. I don't know at what level, but I think I want to work in games. I was like, shit, we should start doing like developer profile stuff. Yeah. So we're going to start off talking about game designers. But Kevin, we need to get some housekeeping out of the way. What have you been playing? Um, Nothing new. Nothing new. Oops. Dropped a thing. I've been All playing stuff. Yeah. Super Smash Bros. Melee mm-hmm. because there's a tournament coming up next weekend, apparently. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just trying to, trying to represent... Looking to crush it? Province. Probably won't crush it, but hopefully do decent. It's an off-island tournament, right? Um, well, it's on the island, but people from off-island are coming. Right. Gotcha. So, yeah. Gotcha. It's, it's Maritime's wide tournament, which is okay. cool. And no. um, also been practicing a little more sunshine. Mostly just been like polishing up the parts I already know. I need to get back into like learning new parts so that I can complete a run. Right. Right. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. That's it. And you know what I've been playing? Literally nothing. I haven't played a single game in a week. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of anticipated this. Um, I don't know. I've just been doing a lot of more other stuff, I guess. I'm doing yeah. a little bit of writing. Kind of feeling creatively tapped a little bit. What took out a lot of energy was the... Oh, I, I forgot to bring it up. The Titan Souls Let's Play, which is going to be pretty cool. We're going to be doing mm-hmm. 18 days of Titan Souls. There are 18 bosses in the game. And we'll be doing 18 days of Titan Souls. There's going to be a hype trailer coming up for that in a few days' time. And it's supposed to start, I think, on the 26th of January? 26th, 29th? Sure. 26th? I think it's 26th. Anyway. Um, no, not 26th. It's like 29th. But anyway. I'm stoked on it. Really excited. Um, I hope you guys like what's going on there. And uh, it was nice to kind of have to edit like a like, like a trailer like that. Yeah, that was that was refreshing because I don't know. I feel like you're like this too, where you're not really compelled to do things unless you're being challenged in some way. Yeah. And with this, like, not that I don't like doing the YouTube thing anymore. Like, it's a lot of fun, but you kind of get into a rhythm and like. As far as the editing goes on most of our videos, it's pretty fucking easy. It's yeah. just monotonous and just a lot of rendering time. So I'm trying to push things in different ways to make it more interesting for myself so that I will still want to put out content. So that's why I'm doing like cool trailers like that. Yeah. And um, I'm, I want to, I don't know. I, we're going to have this discussion now. I want to kind of move more of the podcast, more of that stuff done to the point where we're so well prepared beforehand that we don't even need to edit it. It literally, it can just be exported as is. So I'd like to start doing this with the video loop in OBS and then prepare packages that we can then do live like we do our sound effects, but on a bigger level. I think that'd be so much fun. It'd be practical skills, but at the same time, then you you don't get to edit it out and post. Yeah. My least favorite saying, just fix it and post. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What do you think of that? Um... Yeah, there's there's a few challenges to overcome there, namely the that's the fun trimming part. at the beginning and the end. Yeah, no, I yeah. and that's what I was thinking about. And I was thinking if we just properly prepare, we shouldn't have to do that. Yeah, but we just have to get on our game, step our game up. But I don't know. Let, let me know what you guys think. If you, if you want us to do more edit heavy videos or what you want, I'd like to keep the podcast pretty light on that side of things, so we can actually stay more up to the minute because the renders on these things are long like recording it's about an hour and then the render is usually about like four or five hours um it it just takes a while to get up and i would like to be able to have more up-to-date information yeah 
in our podcast. But anyway, that's neither here nor there, Kev. Now we got a bunch of hard hitting topics to topic go. What do you wanna what do you wanna start with here? Um It's all you, bud. The pressure is on. It's it's a let's, tough one. Come on, dude. Let's start with Zelda. Okay. So now you may have heard of this, the Nintendo Switch. Yes. Maybe. Maybe heard some bit. things, saw a super awkward conference. I was that was awkward. You're just gonna switch it over to that? <laughs> How many times did they do that, man? They did that too much. It was so cheesy. So but cheesy. They knew it was they cheesy. Knew, yeah. Oh, they, they they had to have known it was cheesy. So now the Switch not launching with too much of a lineup, really. No. It seems like they're pushing it out just for Zelda. Yeah. And I, I heard people saying that, well, like, oh, Zelda's gonna be huge because Zelda's always been huge. And I'm like, has Zelda always been huge? So I went through and I looked at its sales history. Mm-hmm. Not near as huge as people make it out to be. Yeah. It's really not. The highest selling Zelda game is Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess at 8.58 million units. And that's sold between the Wii and the GameCube. The Wii selling 7.26 and the GameCube selling 1.32. And that came out in 2006. Yeah. That's really not that crazy. To put it in perspective, and you said it's an unfair comparison, but I really, anyway. Um, Uncharted 4, which came out just last year. A like decade not, e- later. Not, even, not even a year ago. Not a decade even, later. Not even Twilight a Princess. year ago on a system that wasn't even selling as fast. Yeah. Just, just putting that out there, too, if we're going to be fair about this. A system that's not even selling as fast because the, the Wii was unprecedented how fast it sold eventually yes anyway (laughs) so um yeah it's already at 8.7 million and it's only on one console not two yeah okay just saying just saying yeah and it's a newer ip and a decade more of gamers being added to the pile well let's compare that then to something a little more fair which came out in 2011 legend of zelda skyward sword at 3.67. Which wasn't very liked by players. It's not as hated as you make it sound, though. At a 7.9 user score on Metacritic, that's yeah, like where, an 8. Yeah, where do people put Skyward Sword on their, on their list of favorite Zelda games, though? It goes <laughs> so low, except for the odd people who like Skyward Sword a lot. But, like, I don't know. It's, Skyward Sword is not the, not the ideal Zelda game in most people's minds. Uncharted 1 sold more than Skyward Sword. Yeah. Uncharted 1 kind of sucks. <laughs> like, Skyward Sword kind of sucks. <laughs> does it suck that bad, though? Because it has a, a Metacritic score from the critics of 93%. Yeah. I, everybody finds that weird. Okay. It reviewed really well. Most people didn't really like it, Because though. then let's compare that to Twilight Princess, the best-selling Zelda game, at a meta score of 9.5%, or 95%, which is only a two point difference yeah and a user score of nine which is a 1.1 percent 1.1 difference so 11 point difference yeah that's not that huge one's in the sevens and one's in the nines that's a really big deal for user 7.9 though user score like bottoms out at like 7.3 hardly look at something like amy hot trash (laughs) oh terrible but anyway um yeah and then the worst performing uh, of them is wow i thought people like this game four swords adventures no people don't like this game no it was difficult as hell to like it was just who plays that game okay <laughs> like you need the game boy advance things for it to be fun at all but that means you need four game boy advance with four yeah connector cables it just wasn't now triforce heroes seems to be the most recent zelda game that wasn't on like a console it only sold 1.14 million yeah, please describe the trailer for that game for me. I don't even know. Yeah, it was not marketed at all. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> that's exactly why. That's why marketing is important. Yes. Yeah. Like, I didn't even hear about Triforce Heroes until after it came out. Right, right. Like, it was insane how, like, under-marketed it was. Okay. Hmm. Minish hmm. Cap is probably the game that deserves the least to be that far down. Oh, really? You'd yeah, say so? It's actually quite a good game. Okay, it came out in 2004. All Link Between the game Worlds Pants. is actually really good as well. Yeah? And, yep, it's really far down there. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Although, Nintendo's always been kind of kind of rude with their marketing towards the mobile Zelda games. Yeah? Yeah, despite a lot of them being quite good, they really 
don't give a shit about it at all. Yeah, it seems like the highest hitter on the list is the Phantom Hourglass at uh, 4.76 million, which came out in 2007. Yeah. Hot off the heels of Twilight Princess. Could have something to do with it. Yeah, probably. I think it was like people wanted more of the Wind Waker style as well. Right, right. And that's kind of what they got. Because yeah. Wind Waker, you know, it only sold 4.43 million units. So now what I really want to get into, I don't want to just talk numbers this whole this whole segment, is how much does Zelda actually matter? You know, is it worth putting your console out? It seems like they're putting the console out way too early. It doesn't even have fucking Netflix at launch. Mm-hmm. That's ridiculous. That's insane. And, you know, at launch, you can only upload screenshots. You can't save videos. You can't do any yeah. of that stuff. You can just do screen. So it seems like they're pushing this console out early for a game that was intended for the previous pl- uh, console anyway. Because mm-hmm. I feel like Zelda's probably been ready for a while now. <coughs> probably not. <coughs> You don't think so? No, they released some numbers the other day. There's a stupid amount of collectibles in this game. Like okay. Getting 100% in it be like a huge <coughs> time sink. Yeah, but that's collectibles. I mean, the game could have been done, and they're like, okay, they want us to do it on the Wii U as well, or the Switch as well. Okay, then we'll toss more in there. <coughs> um, <coughs> you don't think so? No, probably not. Nintendo doesn't really work that way. Right. They're more like, is this game exactly what we want? No? Okay, put more time into it. Right, right, okay. But, I mean, that doesn't always work out with the best games. I don't know. <sighs> People hold Nintendo to such a high standard and say they're so, they, they, they only make good games, but they don't necessarily. No, yeah, they've definitely put out a few bad games. <laughs> yeah. But, I don't know. Okay. Just, I think, in general, they put quality games out on a more consistent basis than most companies. But they put out less games than most yeah. companies. Okay. Fewer games and they delay way more often than other companies. <coughs> That's just how it works. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about my cough, guys. This is <laughs> hopefully it should be gone by next episode. And uh, um yeah, one company that puts out like the most or the the most like consistently high quality games is Blizzard, who uh yeah. puts out games so rarely. Yeah, no, they absolutely do. Y- you are right there. Um yeah, I don't know. It's just something interesting to think about. So do you think it's worth putting out the console early, even premature, for basically just Zelda? I think Nintendo at this point really needs a launch title. Yeah. A very, very strong launch launch then, title if they want to do a new console. Why wouldn't they wait till fall? When they can have Super Mario Odyssey, they can have the Zelda, they can have all those games coming together because it's, it seems like at this point, like the March kind of that area is like, it's the new holiday season. You know what I mean? Like that's where big games are coming out. It's Q1. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. It's like they want to start off a year strong for investor reasons. Right. I understand that aspect of it, but I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's just not fucking ready. (laughs) Like you (laughs) should have waited till 2018 or something. I don't know. Well, like, they feel like they can get it ready before the holiday season, and they can do a holiday push. Right. They'll have a bigger uh, library of games at that point than if they launch it in fall. Now, with this being the case, do you think they're going to pull that artificial scarcity bullshit that they always do? Uh, it seems like they are. Yeah. Um, our province actually got off really well, but in neighboring province, New Brunswick, uh, all of the game stops in New Brunswick got right. 35 switches. All of them in the whole province. Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. How does that make any sense? I don't know. Because how many people are there in New Brunswick? Like, I think it's like 300 or 400. Yeah, 400,000 people. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. Not even one for every one out of every 10,000 people. I guess I should say EP Games. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, same thing. Yeah. I, th- I think the parent company is GameStop, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They still, they still have like Best Buys and Walmarts and stuff. So oh yeah, there's, there's more more consoles out there than that. But yeah, like there's very few going around. I think. Huh. Yeah. Why did they do that? I think our EB Games in Charlottetown is sold out on pre-orders for it. Probably. I'm not even gonna. Yeah. Uh, like, is it something you're even gonna buy at launch? I you don't already know. have a Wii U, so you can just play the Zelda game. Yeah, I know. It's it's coming out at the same time. It will yeah. be better on the Switch, but. I, don't know, I think I need more for the Switch to really sell me on it. Well, will it be that much better? Because, I mean, given the numbers that are coming out, it's only running at 900 on the Switch. And it's running at 720 on the Wii U. Yeah, that's like a 15% difference. Yeah. It's actually like really, really big. Is it worth buying a new console big, though? No, probably not. Right. But it will look a heck of a lot nicer. And we'll have to see like you know how frame rates actually 
pan out as well. Right. One right. of them might run worse than the other. Yeah, because according to TB, it was running definitely not 60. Yeah, demo versions. Yeah, yeah, and it is an older build. But they did say 30 FPS on both. Right, locked at it. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, yeah, but as far as the Zelda game goes, it looks fucking awesome. Yeah. I'm really stoked yeah, on it, it cool. with regards to how it looks. I think, I don't know. I will become a Zelda fan or a Nintendo fan in general as soon as they stop making hardware. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know, man. If I could play a fucking Zelda game on my PS5, I would do that in a heartbeat. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I think in general, they just benefit from more availability of their products. Yeah. Do, do you think... Okay. <sighs> I felt like the the uh, the Wii U was kind of the canary in the coal mine as to like they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And given the marketing of Switch so far and just how everything seems so off, I still don't know if they know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. I know that they have a lot of money and they can last, you know, there's been figures going around that they can last till 2040 or even further than that, 2057 or something yeah. like that, given how much money they have and they can just hemorrhage money every fucking year. Um, but that's not a good decision (laughs) like given their investors and everything like that i think shit would start to fall sideways but um do you think if the switch is a failure that they're going to actually move to software just software not make hardware anymore i have no idea like what it takes for them to do that right because the other thing too is the actual hardware engineers yeah that they have at nintendo are quality as fuck yeah yeah, like everything they make, like is super reliable. Th- they make you know, durable products really for sure well at really good price pay- points. Yeah, like there's a lot of really good value there. Um, so like, yeah, they'd kind of be abandoning all that, and if they can't like rework it somehow, then right, you know, it's a really big waste. Yeah, which I think is like why they're why it's like you even haven't been in consideration for them. Right. Um. Yeah, I feel like. You know, if the Switch really fails, it'll probably take longer for a new console than uh, you think so. They did with the Wii U, because yeah, there's certainly a bit of the Wii U fell out of favor overly quick, quickly. It did, and I think we're getting less Nintendo fans and more Nintendo apologists, and those apologists aren't going to stay around forever. Yeah, as as they shouldn't. I d- I don't think any consumers should stand by a product if they start or a company if they start making shit products yeah leave the fucking company like you know what <laughs> i mean like if sony starts making shit i'm gonna buy <laughs> yeah i don't know it's weird because most of nintendo's like fuck ups is in like the just the production sense of it right and yeah i don't it's it's weird how a change in that needs to come around yeah it's probably like removing a bunch of execs Maybe, maybe give yeah. them uh, what do they call them? Window facing jobs. Yeah, yeah, because they don't actually they don't actually really fire in Japan, right? They just they give them people like shitty jobs. Yeah, they move them. Yeah, to something they don't like. Move them down into the basement. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, that's really weird. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just a different culture thing. I shouldn't say it's weird. It's interesting, for sure, and something we don't really do over here. But no. yeah, I don't know, man. It's uh, do you have high hopes for the Switch? Um, I really hope they get like the games lineup together on it. Yeah. Um, the Mario Kart Eight Deluxe Edition. It's a little bit disappointing. I kind of wish they went for Mario, like Mario Kart Nine. Yeah. Um, because Mario Kart, Kart Eight is legit. Yeah, it's it's a super super yeah. good game. Um, and the new Mario game they're doing looks bad. Sonic O Six vibes. Yeah. That's what I get from that. Yeah, it's. it's I weird. don't. I don't know why they decided to mesh it with the real world. I don't know. Apparently, that's just one of the worlds. Yeah. That's not the whole game. But who the fuck knew that Mario was that short? Yeah. He's like two feet tall. Yeah. He's barely <laughs> barely up tiny. to the handle of a door on a car. <laughs> yeah. <It's> weird. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. I, I feel like that's really what the Switch needs. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, they can price drop in the future as well. Because they haven't been able to price drop on the Wii U. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, like, how inclined would a consumer be to actually get the system when it's more expensive than more powerful hardware yeah you know what i mean like you can get a ps4 with a game for 250 bucks yeah or you can get a nintendo switch with no game for 300 dollars. yeah i don't know it's it i needs yeah it needs some pretty pretty strong 
games for it. And I also find like what's really weird is they didn't put the uh, one two switch game packaged in. That seems like such a because it it seems it doesn't seem like a game I would ever buy. But if it came with the system, I'd be like, well, I know this will be kind of fun at parties. It'll be like the, the Wii Sports, right? Yeah, they need yeah. a Wii Sports for this console, and they're just and ignoring I, it. I really don't. I really don't know how that's not included with it. Like it doesn't. Yeah. I, it doesn't seem like the kind of game that people are going to go out and buy. Like I just I don't see that. It doesn't have any big properties attached to it or anything like yeah. that, which is Nintendo's biggest thing is their properties. And I'm really amazed that that's not included with the system. I mean, I'm sure there'll be SKUs that have that included with it for like 350 or something like that. But like, what yeah. the fuck? Yeah, that's just weird. <laughs> that's super weird. And then speaking of just more weirdness, the Joy-Cons. I don't know, man. The single Joy-Con seems really small. Apparently, it's it actually feels pretty nice. Yeah? Yeah. Because I've seen I people... I won't judge it until it's in my hands. Yeah, like, I've seen people use it that I know have smaller hands than me, and they're like, oh, I'm having trouble with this, and I, I got some big hands. I'm like, I'm never going to be able to use the single Joy-Con yeah. ever. <laughs> yeah, I'm also curious, like, how many games do you actually need to do that for? I don't know if you need to do it for any. I mean, if you want, you can shell out the extra 80 bucks for another set of Joy-Cons. Yeah. Or a pro controller. For $70. Yeah. $10 more than a PlayStation 4 controller, which is vastly superior. Vastly. 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 Anyway, (laughs) we're going to move on from that to what do you want to do? Gameplay versus story, hard versus punishing? Yeah, either of those. Okay. Let's go in with hard versus punishing. Now, as you guys know, I finished Titan Souls not too long ago, and I've also been... I started up a new series kind of that started at the beginning of this month called Video Games. And some people out there kind of like it. They mm-hmm. want more of it. Mm-hmm. And I've uh, I've put, I've tried to come up with some stuff and like some ideas. And I'm just, I'm not feeling any of them yet. Um, I was working on uh, the concept of the level up. You and I actually started that like two months ago. Yeah. Yeah. And we did a whole whiteboard thing and it was, uh, it was fun. I was into it then, but I wasn't, I'm not into it right now. So (laughs) anyway, so I I started going down that path and making like a uh, 2d side scroller and I put about a couple hours into it and I'm just like, I'm not feeling this right now. So I've switched it over from playing Titan souls to be like, Hmm, this this is a punishing game. This is not just a hard game. It's Mm -hmm. not fun in that aspect. So I want to look at you know, the comparisons between what makes a hard game a fun game or an interesting game, not just a punishing game. And I did, uh, I pretty much spent all morning today just listening to extra credits videos on this topic. So I feel um, like I can have a good discussion about it right now. And I've, I started going down that rabbit hole and I'm like, you know what? I just need to spark a conversation on podcast, maybe get you guys your opinions on it too. And so that you'll know what the next video games game is going to be about. So, what do you think, Kev? What makes a hard game a fun game, not just a punishing game? Yeah. Um, you might have heard me talk about this before, but yeah. my general theory when it comes to video games mm-hmm. is when people are having fun playing a video game, yeah, they're actually having fun because they're learning. Yeah, I, and, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the perspective I take towards all kind of like game design type things. And uh, yeah, it very much applies here. A hard game is hard but you're learning how to overcome that hardness right the entire time whereas a punishing game is you know it's really difficult it feels unfair yeah it feels unfair because you're not learning how to progress further right i mean uh yeah yeah i I would absolutely agree with that i think that's a key aspect of comedy too right whereas people find things funny because they're learning and making new connections in their brains and that's what uh provides them with a good experience so I'm, i'm absolutely on board with that so now how do you ensure that a player is learning something? I mean, I guess the biggest key would be to keep the rules of the world consistent. Now, what would I mean by something like that? So, like... Because I, I assumed yeah. that's where you were going to go, too. Um, yeah, it's it's sort of part of that. It's like, you know, if the player is, like, learning things, mm-hmm. or they think they're learning things, yep. then, as, like, a game designer, you need to reinforce that those things they learned will be used. Okay. Um, and if the rules around the game aren't consistent, then they're going to think they're learning something and then be be defied by the game itself and be like, nope, that's not how this works. Right. Um, and yeah, that feels very unfair if it just comes out of left field. Yeah. If it isn't prepared properly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a really big part of it. 
I think uh, there's another part of it too, though, where it's just like some gameplay mechanics are aren't like something that you can progressively learn. Okay. Um, what do you mean? So, see if I can bake this down into like a really simple example. Because that's what I've been trying to do all morning, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what would I do it with? <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah, I guess it's progressive learning versus um, instantaneous learning. Yeah. And so with an example, like super simple example of instantaneous learning is Mario learning the A button makes you jump. Right. Simple. Um, A super simple example of progressive learning is um, maybe like the points system that you get when you jump on enemies, Mario. Um, you'll like eventually learn how to jump on one enemy after another after another, and you'll kind of learn that those points go up, um, and you get a reward in the end there. Okay, I was thinking of uh, going with the run mechanic and how that increases your jump. Um, Is that not an example of that? I, I thought it would be because none of progressive. Really? No, I don't think because because it's, it's not- only a singular thing you're learning. Um, you aren't learning how to do. But there are different animations that indicate how far he will jump based upon that run, right? Uh, he has a running animation. Oh, is it is it just binary? Is it yeah, like it's just binary? Oh, I thought there were different increments. Yeah, no, in that. Just... Oh, okay, if there were different increments in that, then I would be correct in that assumption, right? Yeah, there's there's different increments in the jump on how high you jump based on how how long you hold A. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Oh, no, not not based on how long you're. I thought it was based yeah. on how long you've been holding B, and then you jump further based upon that. Oh, okay. yeah, and no, I was just holding A down. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, which I kind of force you to learn instantaneously in that game as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, something that's more like a skill that you have to develop, such as bouncing on enemies' heads. Right. Um, that's kind of more progressive because you, you, yeah, it's easy enough to bounce on one enemy's head. Um, Can you do it on two? Is two a little bit or more difficult. Four or, Three is yeah. a little more difficult. And it just kind of goes on and on like right. that. Right. Um, so yeah, that would be something a little more progressive. Um, and. When you look at something like a hard game versus a punishing game, um, a hard game, they usually rely on these progressive mechanics. Um, like Dark, Dark Souls and Dark Parrying. Dark Souls being a very good example. Like, um, I would say parrying is like... Well, it just goes... Super it's basically just health bears yeah. that do it. Um, okay. Health bears on the bosses, you can see how far you get. You're right. probably going to get further and further. Um, your own health bear, if you mess something up, then you have so much more opportunity to mess it up again. Right. And the health bar is an example of progressive learning. Um, right. It, it uh, permits progressive learning. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause it allows you to get multiple chances as well as see your progress. And that was my biggest issue with Titan souls where I felt it was more of a punishing game because there's not a health bar. It's one hit for either of you and you're dead. Yeah. Basically is how it works. Yeah. Which, which sounds interesting. Oh yeah. Um, I, I shit in the game a lot only because I found it really hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, it, it sounds really interesting from a mechanic perspective, but there's a lot of, like, difficulty in implementing that in a way that um, allows players to learn progressively. Right. Um, I think, of, like, some examples of maybe doing that is you have to, like, take down barriers yep. from you getting to the boss, and you can see, like, how close you're getting to the boss right. to get that shot that you need. You know, that that could be progressive learning. Um Assuming that what you need to do to take down the barriers is the same as you need to do to take down the boss. Right. Um, you know, then the player can feel like they're getting further and further each time, mm. assuming that the thing they need to do is fair as well. Right, right. So, yeah, it, it, it just sets itself up in a way that's really difficult to permit that. Because, like, Dark Souls, the health bar just kind of permits it, and they can just kind of, like... Progressive learning just happens naturally, whether they really think about designing that way or not. Right. Um, whereas, you know, Titan Souls, they set themselves up in a situation where they need to be thinking about how to allow the player to progressively learn. Right. Um, it just sounds like they maybe didn't do very much because it's I, a weird I think thing they to did think on about when aspects. you're designing. I, well, I mean, with 18 bosses, right, you're not going to nail them all. Yeah. I think some were better than others with that aspect. Yeah. And then others were just like, I just got to hope I got a lucky fucking shot. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, yeah, what it really comes down is allowing the player to learn a lot while they play. 
Um, yeah, there's. I feel like I mentioned this last week or something, but yeah, there's a GDC talk mm. that I watched where it was just like a game that they were like working on. The game hasn't come out or anything. Yeah. Um, but they found like in some of their prototypes when they demoed it to friends and stuff that their friends didn't know how to get further. It just felt lucky. Yeah. Even Which, though there is like good ways to play the game. Right. Um, yeah, it's just kind of not great. I feel like Tetris actually falls into that <laughs> issue a bit as well. Okay. Whereas it's really not clear how to play Tetris well. Yeah, I think you learn from watching other people and then you're like, oh, yeah, that's logical, right? I should keep everything to one side and then manage yeah. based upon that. Yeah. Because I didn't even think to play that way until I saw someone else play that way. I was like, I've been playing Tetris wrong my whole life. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like something you need to put a lot of thought into it outside of the game. That's, yeah. That's weird. Not the worst. Like that. That's the depth for sure. But it's you aren't leading the player there in the gameplay. Itself. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting about Tetris because I would say Tetris is one of the great games of all time. Yeah. And uh, yet it doesn't really fall in that way you were talking about. So I don't know. Well, like, so I think it's a, a pivot in like how game it, design's been thought about. Yeah. Somewhat recently. Contemporary game design, if you will. Um, whereas game design nowadays is a lot more about making sure a good majority of players have similar good experiences. Right. Um, which is why like Dark Souls falls out of the paradigm because it, it's, it's okay with people not enjoying its difficulty. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for the most part, like they're just trying to make sure everybody learns the same amount and plays the game and has the same amount of fun playing the game. Right. Um, whereas, you know, previously back in like the Tetris days and stuff, it was much more like, oh, let's let's make a game and not really think about the player experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just want to um, make it fun. Kind of yeah. going through the game. They're just like, yeah, let's let's make something that's fun to play a lot of. Yeah. Which, is, which is, I think is why a lot of people see those games as like classic and why they see game quality as being better back then than it is now. Right. It's right. because the games were designed focused around being fun for a very long time. Yeah. You know, especially like the arcade games where, you know, they want people to continuously put quarters in because they want to play it more because yep. it's fun to play a lot of it. That addictive kind um, of gameplay. Yeah. yeah. Whereas games nowadays are much more focused around the uh, single playthrough right. kind of experience. So now, that being said, now I'm going to ask you an impossible question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now if... Let's say if Tetris didn't come out in the 80s or anything like that, and it comes out 2017, this new game called Tetris, do you think it would be the same thing that it, because there's no nostalgia glasses on it, right? Like if nothing like Tetris came out until fucking today, do you think it would hook players in the same way and become kind of a phenomenon? I think a similar comparison in a game that came out recently that has similar like levels of simple gameplay and mm. depth to gameplay is a threes or 2048 or whatever variant. Right. Right. That. Yeah. Those are and only flashes in the pan though. Yeah. They were flashes in the pan. They did really, really well. Yeah. And you think Tetris would fall into the same category. About, and they're not going to be like historic games. And I think Tetris would fall into that if it came out. Right. Nowadays. I think that's fair. I think that's absolutely fair. I think, yeah, I think if we had like a Mario coming nowadays and there no, were no platformers beforehand. I don't want to give a shit because there's so many fucking games coming out now, <laughs> which is part of the problem, right? But back yeah. then, it's like, whoa, a new game. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, because genres are being invented back then. Yeah. Yeah. Or when genres are invented now, it's an indie game. Yeah. Yeah. And people much. are like, well, because so many genres have been invented, the ones that work have been found for the most part. Yeah. So when new genre type games come out, it's like, yeah, this is cool and it works for this game, but how do you make a different game based on the same stuff? And it just kind of feels impossible for a lot right, of that stuff. Right. Like one thing I think that not a genre, but a mechanic that I think should be in fucking every game is the nemesis system. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised that it, I've yet to see it in another game yet. I mean, the game did come out not too long ago. Yeah. But I, I should hope to see that in a lot more shit because everyone fucking loves the nemesis system. If you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's fucking what's Shadows that? of Mordor. Yeah. Shadows of Mordor. Um, yeah. Enemies remember you. Yeah, and it's just super cool. They have their own story arcs and stuff yeah. like that, and yeah, it is really really cool. I feel like you know the game kind of like revolves around it a bit. Yeah, so it's kind of defining in that way. But I, mm. I don't know. I I feel like it should be the prestige system of action RPGs. Right. Um. So 
I don't know, maybe maybe uh, Assassin's Creed will start doing something similar. Hopefully. That would be exciting. Now, I want to move on to the next object, but I just remembered something that JJ and I were talking about the other day. Uh, mm-hmm. You may know JJ. He comments in the... Uh, for, not forums, uh, comments every once in a while, and uh, he's been on a couple episodes. Anyway, um, so he was talking to me, and he said something that I thought was, I'm sorry, JJ, but profoundly stupid. But I'm <laughs> curious to see what you think about it. <laughs> he knows there's no hatred there. I mean it in the nicest way possible. Um, he said that he feels like the jump between like PS3 and Xbox 360 is more of a half step, and that we're getting ps4 pro and project scorpio that's more of a full step i think that's i don't know if that's necessarily a good way of looking about it and then he we started to get into the concept of well what defines a generation aside from just the company being like this is a new generation you um, know what i mean what distinguishes between generations of consoles does it mean the 1s it's so the problem 1s are comparable yeah yeah no no he, he means scorpio actually he means scorpio yeah he does mean scorpio yeah, okay. yeah. Um, yeah because yeah the pro is not on that level at all no it's, it's not it's not um which i think is certainly interesting but i mean it, it comes back to something that uh you know colin moriarty talks about a lot is you know take a game show me a game that's come out on ps3 or ps4 that couldn't fundamentally i mean you know not all the same prettiness and all that shit that couldn't be played on like a ps2 mm-hmm. you know what i mean i think he makes a fair point you know what what does define a generation yeah, what, like uh, what makes it been fucking better around consoles because consoles are like the way to play video games. Yeah, the thing is now the PC market is gigantic. It is. It, it is, is blown up a lot since since basically it started with the 360 and PS3. Yeah. Um, yes. Generation. Steam has been a huge proponent of that, and what that does is it really, really muddles the waters of what a generation is mm. because PC is kind of this. It's a, it's like a fluid in how things progress. Right. It's not like consoles where they were doing steps up in power. PC is just every year more powerful stuff comes out. And the games, they aren't always like targeting the most powerful stuff. They're targeting where, where the majority is at. Right. And where the majority is at, it's, that, that just relies on so many different variables. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, how the economy is doing, you know, is the new architecture actually cheap or, you know, whatever. Um so in that sense, like PCs is a really fluid thing that doesn't have steps at all, mm. um, and that being with a bigger market share makes it really difficult to put generations to it. Right. Um, and especially, I think like you know, it's the PC and console crossover games that make that even more weird. Yeah. Um, because you know, they're the same games except one's on this generational hardware and one's not. Right. Um. So, you know, where does it actually fall? I think the first kind of signs that, you know, the generation... Uh, I, I think the generations are ending. That's where I'm going with what I'm saying okay. here. Okay. And I think the first signs of that was uh, how notable... And, like, uh, reviewers and, like, game journalists and stuff all the time really noted how big the difference was between the start of the 360 PS3 generation and the end of it. Right. Games made a dramatic improvement in looks. More so on the time. PS3, but yes. Yeah. Uh, it happened a lot on the 360 as well, actually. Well, it, uh, it was more so on the PS3 because of the cell architecture. That's fucking weird. Yeah, it took a long time for them to learn. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> Mark Cerny's a weirdo, but he figured it out for PS4. So that's but good. even, yeah, compare yeah. the differences between uh, Halo 4 and Halo 3. Like, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah it, was, it happened on both consoles a lot. And that's kind of like, okay, does that mean there's... Is there an extra step inside the generational step? Right. Right. Where like things like the cell architecture got figured out. Yeah. Or how people learn to deal with the Xbox version of DirectX. Like, yeah. You know, there's that kind of stuff um, that happened during that generation that didn't really happen so much in the generations before. Yeah. Um, no. no it Super didn't. Nintendo, maybe, but that was kind of cheating because they were putting extra processors in the game cartridges. Yeah, that's not fair. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's you know not not really the same thing. Yeah, uh, because it was like a you know it was a defined step between games that had the coprocessors and the games that didn't. Right. Um, so yeah, the 360 and the PS3 generation kind of really started that like seeing an improvement of things within the generation itself. Hmm. 
Um, and yeah, I think that's that's what really kicked off like the end of the generation. Okay. And then, yeah, yeah I, would, I would say that's probably solidified by the fact that Sony and uh, Microsoft seem to want to do incremental bumps in improvement. Yeah, yeah, it seems like that's what they're doing now. And I, I think it kind of makes sense. It keeps them in line with what the PC is doing more. And since Microsoft especially is pushing towards PC and console parity. Right. Um, yeah, which is something I think is really interesting. I like that they're doing that a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's nice because <laughs> yeah. hopefully they'll keep their console games actually kind of following. Uh, yeah, PC I, performance. Yeah, because I'm I'm not going. I'm I'm not going to buy an Xbox One. I just don't see the point, especially because I can just get the games on my fucking PC now. So sounds good. Yeah, if they actually release a console exclusive that I'm interested in, RIP Scalebound. I wasn't interested <laughs> in Scalebound. I just wanted to bring that up. Okay, Kev, we're gonna get into it. Yeah, first, do you want to talk about your developer profile or gameplay versus story? I think gameplay versus story will tail end nicely into talking about game designers. So I'm going to yeah. choose for you, actually, sure. after I asking. thinking the same thing anyway. Perfect. So where do you come down on this? Gameplay versus story. What is, I'm not going to say more important. Hmm. Now I'm going to say more important, even though I know that's not the right yeah. way to say that. Because without any gameplay, the fucking story isn't there. I mean, this is this is clear, right? So, because we kind of got into the concept of what is gameplay the other week. Yeah. Now let's let's run off of that. So, in the gameplay versus story kind of thing. Mm. First, I'm going to take the utopia perspective. Okay. Video games are the perfect medium for the two to be the exact same thing. There's a term for this called ludo narrative. Yeah. No, I see where you're coming from. A good example of this is Dark Souls. We I've never heard of that game. What? what, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's a yeah, it's, it's a game that really kind of it has a very strong theme to it, and right. the gameplay elements in the game reinforce that theme. Okay. Um, and the story kind of follows that, and you see your actions in the game kind of follow a prophecy mm-hmm. of sorts. Um, so that's how they tied gameplay and story together. Albeit they did it with doing very minimal story. Right. So obviously we're still trying to figure out how to actually do like movie scale stories that have gameplay ties. Right. Um, on a very kind of equivalent level, which I think is, I don't know, maybe we'll never get there because movie stories are very controlled. They are controlled. Yeah. Um, and gameplay like interactive gameplay is, by definition, uncontrolled. Yeah, I mean, you can you can hope to have the player looking in a certain direction to make something look like this, but yeah. it's just not going to work. And that's, but it, yeah, if you stop them from doing that, then you're taking away interactivity. Which, exactly. So you can give them a cutscene that looks straight out of like a fucking movie, but then you're kind of defeating the purpose, aren't you? Yeah, it's not a game. Anymore. Then why don't you just make a fucking movie? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, no, that's that's definitely an interesting point. I was going to say something. Oh, yeah. So um, I see where you're coming from with the Dark Souls aspect of things. But I mean, the Dark Souls story, like, I mean, this is going to be hard to kind of get. It's hard for me to get my head around. But like, no one really gives a shit about the Dark Souls story. It's only nerds like us, pretty yeah. much. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it really there's a small the following that are, are into it. And I think every single one of them is subscribed to EMB. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. There isn't that much of an actual story there, and I wouldn't say that's a very story-heavy game. Well, another example that's on a similar theme, actually, uh, Dark's Dungeon. Yeah, I've yet to play that, but I'm intrigued. The gameplay by and the story it. really revolves around the whole uh, Cthulhu stuff. Yeah, um, and you know, it's all about insanity and, and lo- losing your mind and stuff. And the gameplay elements right. focus around that, and the story focuses around it, and it does have like a legitimate story arc to it. Okay. Um, so I, I think that's kind of more on the lines of what we can expect for like Ludo narrative mm-hmm. and games and stuff. Um, so now does that imply that a certain type of gameplay should pertain to a certain type of story? Well, I think like, like something games that, have the power to really benefit from combining the two, right. having the two line up. And when they don't line up, it's, it's really weird. Yeah, something that seems peculiar to me is a game that I've yet to play. I hear it's good, but Catherine. Do you, do you know this game? Yeah. Have you heard of this? Yeah. So basically, it's like, a, from what I know, you're kind of dating between two different Catherines. And then the actual gameplay of it, outside of like the 
the, the talking and all that is it's like a puzzle game where you're moving blocks and they're falling down as you fall asleep. Yeah. Which seems odd. I'm like, I don't know. The story in that seems interesting, but the gameplay seems to have nothing to do with it. So it doesn't really want to bring me in. Yeah. It like justifies it by being in a dream, but uh, it's yeah, it's weird and they don't really seem well connected. Because a lot of this with me is, I mean, I'm not going to say I, uh, I want to be a designer because I don't. I don't think I have the mind for it at all. Um, but I don't know. When it, when it comes to wanting to make a game for me, the, the most interesting part to me is the story. Yeah. And that's, that's the most appealing part to me. And that's, I mean, maybe it's because I'm more of a writer than anything else for the most part, be it a songwriter or a poet or whatever. Um, I don't know. I just, I think that's when we're going to get interesting game experiences because, uh, I don't know, shooting people is just so, uh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I don't know. I feel like... FPSs are kind of like a bad example of interactivity. <laughs> They're a bad example of interactivity, but they are one of the biggest examples in games, and we can't ignore that. Yeah. You know, they're the most popular genre in the world right now. Yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> is is that I'm helping? Not really sure, but like, yeah, I don't know. It is certainly a medium that, like, you know, it, it provides an easy amount of interactivity for people to kind of grasp and. You can do a wide variety of genres with the one mechanic. Right. I would also say that it allows for a reasonable level of immersion because, I mean, you're not seeing a character. You're just seeing yeah. hands. And, hey, I have hands. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's that something you can relate well. to. And it also seems like it's a quite good medium to tell a story in as well. Right. A lot of these games are doing pretty, pretty cop-out stories. We are. Cough, cough. Call of Duty. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. But I think from that, we're also seeing my, my favorite genre of game is the walking simulator coming from this that's coming in a totally different direction. Yeah. But there's less there's less gameplay tied to it. I mean, yeah. you're usually picking up or manipulating objects, but is that really a compelling form of gameplay? I, I, I hope that the two meet. But for me right now, when it seems so divisive between having a strong sense of gameplay or having a strong sense of story, I... I'm hard pressed to go with the gameplay. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I just, I can't really do that. I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to pick story over that, which yeah. is something I find interesting that dark souls is my favorite game because it really shouldn't be given that description. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Well, I, I think that's cause like it does actually mesh gameplay and story really quite well together. Yeah. Um, it's just certainly not on a surface level. But yeah, I had to go out of my way to really discover that story, and I'm still learning more about it. Yeah. I think in Dark Souls 2 and 3, they do a little bit better job of creating a point in the game's story that you realize there's more going on than yeah. you might not have if you weren't paying attention at all. Right. Um, so it kind of beats you over the head with it a little more, maybe. Yeah. I yeah. think like the princess fight in Dark Souls 3 is a good example of that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but I, I think... You know, there's the other side of this too, which is why like this utopia, Ludo narrative, every game kind of scenario isn't exactly reasonable, is because you know, people do have their personal preferences between uh, complicated gameplay and complicated story. Right. And you know, that's not something, not something we'll ever escape from, really. Mm. So it's it'll be nearly impossible to do appease both crowds in the same game. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely seems like it just because, I don't know, it seems like they're so, you want the two to be mixed, but we still have the mindset of them being so different Yeah, right now that it's, I think it's just going to have to rely on developers changing at a fundamental level, and yeah. they're only going to change at a fundamental level if consumers demand more, right? Yeah. But like, I don't know, is it Are something gonna... that's even really possible? Because like I said earlier, like... yeah. Gameplay and story are kind of clashing. Story kind of implies this kind of controlled arc. Right. Um, whereas gameplay, you know, the interactivity is like a lot of the player to control things. Right. Well, then what can the story come from? You know, I mean, yeah. there, there is like, um, you know, there's good examples of a emergent story. Yeah. Uh, with like, you know, Dwarf Fortress is one of those. I don't know. Games where uh, you don't know Dwarf Fortress. No. Okay. Um, let's go with Minecraft then. Okay. Yeah. You know, it. where, you know, players kind of make their own story. Yeah. Um, Dwarf Fortress, like it has events happen and like, oh, okay. it's much easier to make a story of it, but it's way more complicated game. Right. 
Um, but yeah, that kind of like emergent story stuff. Like, I don't know, maybe that is the future because that allows for full gameplay. Right. And, they, you know, there are stories that happen there that, you know, people can share with their friends and stuff. Mm, um, mm. But I don't know. Can we actually make a emergent st- or can we actually make a game that can make emergent stories that are like on similar depth to, I don't know, something like Interstellar or, you know, something like that. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's something that's yeah. far too difficult to do. It is. It is. I mean, there are so many different instances of story, like, like what you're talking about. I mean, you can beat someone over the head with a narrative and, you know, have voices going on explaining exposition yeah. and dumping it on you. Or you can have an environment where you have a story in it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the player is going to discover that. So it's... Yep. Yeah, I don't know. It's I don't think it's something we're going to be able to find an answer to. But if I had to pick one right now, I, I would pick story every time. But I'd like to live in a world where the two are inextricably linked together. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Can you continue talking? I just realized I got to do something. Yeah. It's like, it's um, a vamp. <laughs> yeah. I, I think like myself, I prefer the uh, the balance of the two. Like there are games that are pure gameplay that I love, like Rocket League and whatnot. But I think most of my favorite games like have a balance of story and gameplay. Well, I could argue with regards to Rocket League that that may come down to a story that you create within yourself because it's a competitive game, right? Yeah. You're required to then play with other people. So you're you're making your own story in that aspect, I would argue. Yeah, it's... I don't know. It's like almost every game you can kind of make your own story. Like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something that's like almost purely systems. I guess like an arcade game. But like, I don't know. You can still make stories of... Comparing your own performance to others, um, which, yeah, I, I think stories are kind of always going to be emergent in gameplays to some extent. But um, even still, yeah, my my favorite games are the ones that kind of mix the two for the m- most part. Um, good example being Warcraft Three, where it's got a very tight RTS um, gameplay to it. Right, but it's it has a very very good story as well. Okay, like it does both those things well. Um, yeah, and ends up very high on my list of liked games. Number four, in fact. Oh, that's how you brought your phone <laughs> out. I was wondering where you bring yeah. that out. Okay, interesting. This has been less of a uh, of a fighty episode than I thought it would be. <laughs> we get along too well, Kev. Okay, now moving from that, you know, um, let's get into our developer profile now. Yeah. So, what the fuck does a game designer do? I would kind of like to preface this with <laughs> okay. breaking down how games are made. Okay. Um, just so that we can kind of see where we're headed with developer profiles in the future as well. Yes, yes. Um, so on the game creation level, um, let's, let's go from bottom up, let's okay. say. Sounds good. Um, so obviously games are written in code. You need coders. Um, they're called programmers or engineers yes. or coders, you know, whatever. Yep. Um, Someone to do the numbers and the beeps and the boops. Yep. Yeah. So they do a very, very kind of technical thing. Um, but they aren't the ones who decide what's in the game. They just make, make the shit work. What somebody else wants yeah. to actually be in the game. Yeah. That somebody else will be the game designer. So the game designer is the one that kind of writes down how does this game work. Um, you know, what numbers are we putting in for, like, balancing? You know, what narrative are we putting in? Right. All that kind of, all the loose stuff that you don't directly see in the game. Right. Um, but exists. Yeah. Um, kind of in, you know, it's something that you usually exist in your mind. Like, they, they control the player's mental model. Um, the what do you mean th- by that? Control the player's mental model. So, I'll get into that more with the game okay, designer okay. stuff. Okay, yeah. But, first of all... <laughs> We'll go over the rest of the stuff. So um, there's also artists which control, you know, what the player is seeing. Yeah. Um, you know, they work with programmers, designers, tell them what to make. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they do the actual visuals of that. And there's a lot of different branches of artists. Yeah. Um, a lot of them. So maybe we'll get in more into that when we do. If you want a job artist, in games, become an artist. Profile. Fuck. Yeah. There's so many artists. You yeah. need so many artists for yeah. content. It's just yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, those, those are like the three 
big things that you absolutely need in order to make a game. Right. Another thing you're really going to want is a QA, quality mm. assurance. Yep. Um, they do the testing of the games. They find bugs. They give feedback, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's a really big one. Uh, it's great if you have a whole bunch of all those four groups of people, but you probably want some management around it. Yeah. Um, so this management is where it gets weird. Producers, pretty much universal. There's producers for games. Yeah. What they do varies depending on company structure. Yeah. Um, they can do a wider range of stuff as like managing people's hours, um, dealing with, you know, legal stuff, dealing with promotional stuff. Um, relations with publishers yeah all that kind all of stuff a, a lot of a lot of the times in big companies what the job will um, kind of grind down to is mostly communication between uh, different moving pieces and companies and all that kind of stuff right. so the producer is kind of the guy that you would see playing the demo at an e3 or something right yeah. talking because they can talk knowledgeably on most aspects of the game because they're seeing it from a further back picture yeah they should yeah. be seeing seeing all of it and yeah. being very aware of everything in the game right um so yeah, there's that kind of stuff. Sometimes like the hours management and the money management and hiring management, that's its own kind of job. Right, um, right. It's and called then you, project manager, development manager. It, it has a loose title, but normally somebody does fall into that once you get big enough. Right. And then you do get into the businessy side of things. Right? Yeah, and, and, and that, that is kind of well. more businessy. Exactly. And yeah. the higher up producer roles are also businessy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you also get into like studio managers and studio leads and stuff like that, and they're very much business. Yeah, that's that's business stuff. Not necess- I mean, it's needed to create a larger game, but it's more the management of people and yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, they mostly deal with money and stuff like that. Right. So yeah, that's it's kind of the full full uh, list of people from bottom up that we will be talking about in future episodes. But today we're going to be talking about what you do, Kev. Game design. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Okay. So, um, first thing I get get forward is the majority of a game designer's work is on paper. Okay. Or digital paper. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. You know, which wiki type documents or that was just Word a weird way to say that. But okay, like yeah, that. yeah, I catch you. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, the game designer really, really writes down the ideas. Um. For example. If, if we're basically to say like making a video game is like designing or making something out of Legos, mm-hmm. the programmers would make the blocks yeah. that the designer said, hey, we need these blocks to make up this thing. Right. The artists would choose the colors of the blocks. Yeah. The designers would say, hey, here's how all these blocks come together to make it what it is we want. That makes them sound super important. Yeah. Um, which in reality, like... It it is kind of important to like the success of the game, but you know, but all of their parts are needed. Yeah, yeah. Game designer can't do anything without other people. Yeah, um, to actually implement the stuff. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like the fundamentals of what a game designer does. There's a bunch of um, what's the word I'm looking for? I breakdowns of <laughs> what they do. Okay. Um, disciplines. Yeah, of game design. Um, for example, like a game mechanic like it's systems designer um let's look at like a mario actually okay a systems designer would kind of choose okay mario can jump mario can run right mario can pick up this mushroom which allows him to shoot fireballs all those are done with these buttons la di da di da um a level designer would be like okay so here's where we're going to place the blocks the gaps uh the enemies Right. All that kind of stuff. Um, then there's also kind of like, it, it, it doesn't break down super cleanly, but you know, you could put like balancing off on its own. So, um, okay, here's how much, this doesn't work for Mario, but you know, how much damage this enemy does, how much right. damage this attack does. Right. Um, I, I guess in Mario, that stuff would kind of be like, um, how many coins does it take to get a one up? Um, how long do you have in each level? Right, right. Um, that kind of stuff. So the very kind of fine-tuned playing with numbers kind of thing. That's yep. kind of what balancing designers do. Um, there's also, of course, there's a... I don't, I'm not sure what the best name for the narrative designers. They're, they're the kind of more getting into the, like, the writing and right. 
uh, story development and stuff like that. You forgot to mention writers in your earlier aspect. I guess they would kind of be like artists. Not really, no. No. So writers don't really exist on their own. Really? Game designers. Yeah. Interesting. So that'd be like a narrative game designer who, you know, does the writing in the story. And what about like sound Dialogues and stuff. Oh, I did forget sound completely. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> so yeah, video games and sound engineers and stuff too. Yeah. But yeah. Um, as well as sound designers and yeah, there's mis- mixes between these disciplines as yeah. well. So yeah. I won't get too deep into that. Um, but yeah, as you can imagine, there's mixes between all the disciplines because, you know, things just really aren't that black and white. Right. Uh, there has to be a lot of blurring. There's so much working together on things that it's nice to have people who can. Okay. Uh, perform multiple roles. Yep. Do the in-between for those roles. Um, so that's yeah, really important. Um, so anything I'm forgetting about game design stuff? Um, well, something you said that was interesting to me once was that, uh, you know, game designers in different genres of games would look super different like if you're gonna look like a, at a game designer who's i don't know working on a uh, an rpg yeah you know and they're working at like uh, the balance of the game they're just gonna have a fuck ton of numbers in spreadsheets yep so you know you get into that maybe a little bit and talk about like different genres and how that's gonna apply and like so what the fuck does it mean to be a game designer like at, yeah you know so, what i mean yeah i talked about like those different types of game designers and you know sometimes it's one person filling all those roles right but the uh genre of game really really what chooses what balance of those people okay you need um like you said for example rpgs like they need a lot of people doing balancing because there's so many numbers put into the game yeah um and they're, they're huge huge things as well um the other thing is you know it's also rpgs are also very heavy on systems designers right um actually heavy on freaking everything yeah, RPGs which is why people tough. think RPGs are such big games. Yeah, is because there's so much stuff going on. Because the systems designers are going to like manage all the RPG elements, like the leveling up. Yeah, um, collecting gear, how all that stuff works. Yeah, because under all the pretty graphics and everything, it's basically a game of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, that's so, like, pretty much what you it know, is. There's a lot of that stuff going yeah. on, and um, I guess like you know, level design an RPG can vary um, on how much there actually is. For example, a game, a roguelike game, mm, mm. very little much going on as far as like level design or work. They'll right. design pieces and, you know, maybe one will be consulting with the programmers on like how it should be generating. Yeah. Any kind of rules it should follow. Specific but, parameters. That, yeah. You know, yeah. That's nowhere near on the same level as something like Skyrim where you have like 20 different level designers and they're each iteratively working on different pieces of the world and, you know, you need other designers, level designers to kind of seam them all together. Right. Um, stuff like that. So, yeah, even even just that difference in an RPG can make a big deal with how many people you need doing level design. Right. Um, stuff like that. And then, of course, your RPG can vary in narrative a lot. So that will choose how much, you know, narrative work you have. Um, I think in the case of Skyrim, actually, uh, a good portion of the narrative for each like place was done by the level designer for that place. Right. Um, so they can right. kind of tie, you know, so that they control they that like that, well, yeah. that level um, on a, a more complete level. But then they also had like, you know, some narrative designers that were focused on the main story stuff, you know. Right. Where does the player go through? What's the experience that the player has along the way and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so yeah, day to day for a designer can look very, very different depending on the genre and stuff. How so? Um, well, it's like, you know, for the RPG stuff, like the uh, balancing design might be mostly in spreadsheets. I can just import it directly. Yeah. Whereas for something more like an action game, they're probably actually tweaking the numbers right in the engine itself. Right, right. And being like, you know, say, for example, like uh, the Batman games, yeah. they need to figure out, you know, there's health bars going on there in the background. Yep. Um, so they need to figure out, okay, how much damage does um, Batman's punch do? And they'll put a bunch of enemies there and put Batman in the middle and they'll, okay, let's say it does three damage. How does this feel? 
Uh, I think it needs to do a little bit more. That took too long. Four damage. How does this feel? Right. You know, there's a lot of kind of like playing around like that. Right. And technically, they're both both those two designers, RPG and the Batman one, are both doing um, balancing, but mm. it's done in a very, very, very different way. Okay, coming on that Batman thing too, then, I mean, you'd have to have some design going into the aspect of how that fight feels. You know what I mean? For the players, like with regards to different enemy types in there that, that vary up the Batman games, right? Because, you yeah. know, further on you get, well, this guy has a knife, so you can only do a certain attack on so, him like yeah, this. That's... So. Bit of a blurred line, but mostly systems designer. Okay. Would do that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. So that's a yeah. system design thing? Yeah. So systems, it sounds a lot like back end stuff, but it actually. Yeah. It, that's what I would assume from that, but I guess not. So I was kind of including gameplay design in with systems design. Okay. That's how I think about it mentally, anyways. Okay. Si- like the back end systems influence the gameplay a lot as well. So I like to kind of mesh them together even though they might differentiate a bit right right um so yeah gameplay design um that kind of stuff i I throw in with systems because you know think about it in your rpg um you have like your talent tree that you get new abilities from right and stuff like that um that very much influences gameplay okay but it's a system so like you know there is that kind of like it's really next to impossible kind of break or one, mm, mm, you know, one begins, two. one ends, and yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'd say that'd be systems designer kind of control how enemies kind of work and stuff. And then a lot of times, you'll see in uh, how the work gets broken up is um, there'll be like an enemy designer. Yeah, he's doing systems and gameplay type stuff, right? But his only role is to focus on you know the variance and enemies. Yeah, making sure the player kind of has an increasing difficulty curve. Um, Okay. Now it seems like there are lots of different branches of game design, but are there some generic fundamentals that kind of encompass all elements of the game designer? Communication. Yeah. You know, all this stuff needs to go out to the programmers, the artists. Right. uh, QA production, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that everybody has the same vision on the game. A lot of times it's not even really the designers choosing the vision. It's the uh, producer's role to choose the vision. Right. So... You know, the game designer needs to work closely with, you know, the producer who's defining that vision, figure out how to break it out into the game that they want. Right. And how to break every single one of those pieces down to the point that they can pass it off to a programmer or an artist and they can make exactly what's desired. Right. Um, obviously, that's not a very clean process most of the time. Yeah. A lot of times it's a lot of back and forth just to make sure things are where people want them. Um but yeah, it's like very, very important to be able to communicate ideas clearly. Okay. Yeah. So now with someone maybe interested getting into that field or trying to decide if that's something they're interested in, are there any um, things you'd recommend or traits they'd look for maybe in themselves to be like, are you sure this is for you kind of thing? Um, Tough question, I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> I feel like... Game design is something that's really hard to judge whether you like it or not without doing it. Right. Thankfully, there are a lot of options to do it. Download yeah. Game Maker, figure out if you really like playing around with how enemies move or something like that. Right, right. Um, or, you know, another really good example is uh, how I really got into design a lot was uh, Halo 3's Forge. Yeah. So, you know, if you have some, some game you like playing that has like a level editor, map editor, or whatever in it, you know, play around with that a lot. Right. Um, if if you do enjoy playing around with it a lot and that kind of stuff, then yeah, you're probably on the right track to you know liking a design role. Right. Um, and it, is a, it takes a lot of like critical thinking as well. Yeah. So like, like I said before, you have to like break down these pieces and stuff. You also need to find all the edge cases and stuff like that. So, mm. um, you know, if, if something if you enjoy kind of like. Or maybe not even enjoy. It's just like how you work mentally is, you know, breaking things down, um, mm-hmm. finding all the fundamental parts and how the parts interact. Right. Then, yeah, that's definitely a really good mindset that like, really benefits right. a game designer. At least okay. on, like, systems side. You know, the narrative designers, you know, might be a bit different for them. Right. Um, you know, that's, that's always the only thing, too, if you 
you're really like writing and stuff, then you know, in order to apply that to a game properly, then you know, you need to think about how that um, interacts with gameplay elements um, and how a player experiences the story. And like you know, if you find the like story really interesting in the context of games, right? Um, then yeah, that's definitely a good direction for a kind of more narrative focused designer. Yeah. Um, yeah. The only thing to be aware of, I guess, is even though there are these different types of designers, you're very, very unlikely to find a role that is doing just one of those things. Right. You probably yeah. need to be shuffled around into doing, being like a jack of all trades. Yeah. Being able to do everything on a pretty competent level. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the other part of game design, which is a bit difficult. Um, and why it isn't a good fit for a lot of people is because there's a lot of different things you need to be quite competent at. Right. Cool. Yeah. Cool, man. I think that's an episode. Yeah. Awesome. Let us know what you think, guys, about the new um, inclusion of uh, the you know developer profile and everything like that, and what you want us to talk about and all that kind of stuff. Yeah things and junk i'm gonna be honest with you man i kind of zoned out halfway through that i do apologize <laughs> i was just like oh, i'm hungry <laughs> <laughs> anyway guys we will catch you guys next time see ya Woo. good stuff buddy good stuff